Welcome back, WNST, Towson, to Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are into the holiday season. We're still delivering the delicious Taharka mint flicks and chills to your door, as well as peppermint bark. New flavor this month. Take advantage. I didn't know how good the cookies and cream and the cookie dough was going to be until I got it. Now that I got it, I don't want it to go away. Uh, and I have stocked up on the sweet potato uh, crumble here. I'm, I'm holding it up because Don hasn't had it yet. And I want to make him really, really hungry. The uh, sweet potato ice cream, if you can believe that, with a brown sugar and pecan crumble. Some may call it a praline. Uh, I call it get in my belly at a discount, $15.70 off. The eight-pack, when you deliver it uh, to the door, just go online, fill it all out at the end. Coupon code Baltimore Positive. Just spell it like that, and off you go to a delicious way to start 2021. Our friends at Fadley's are shipping crab cakes all over the country and curbsiding to me. I need some crab cakes this week. I'm going over. I'm getting the soup. I'm getting the mac and cheese, throwing down the collards. I'm going all in this week over at Fadley's because it's been too long. Last time I was, it was probably like October. So been about a month and a half without Fadley's. It is time to get over there. Ship those crab cakes anywhere in the country. State Fair and El Guapo are also curbsiding. Please take care of our local friends that have taken care of us, trying to keep all these businesses open. I went over to Omichi's uh, for some curbside. I, I, I saw Nancy over at Beer Point. We're taking care of friends. Uh, we had the councilman talking about Zellas over in Holland. So everybody's got a place. Wherever your place is, take care of your place. Also, make sure you're taking care of our friends at Muller and Gary Realty, as well as Crown Title. we got sponsors coming in for 2021. We're so excited to be having new people, new folks, new voices here at WNST. And that being said, Don, this is an old voice that's always a voice because Baltimore Magazine's always pumping out stuff. I know we had Max on a couple of weeks ago, but also in the spirit of local authors. I had John Eisenberg on this week uh, telling the tragic tale of losing uh, my friend Greg Montgomery, but also his books and how well they're doing. A real local author telling real Baltimore stories. And he's not even a Baltimore on, but we've adopted him in as a native son. Absolutely. It is a pleasure to have back the senior editor at Baltimore Magazine. Not and the really, chief. Not, not the, the chief. chief. We had the chief on. We had Max Wave, the chief. She made us call her Chief Weiss, though, Ron. She, you know, <laughs> there was no fooling around. It was, it was Chief Weiss. Uh, but before we get to the latest edition, and it is out there now, the latest issue, it's out on your newsstands. And I will say that, as Max pointed out, by the time you buy two issues over the course of the year, it's just easier to subscribe. So if you're out there, you, it really is one of the fine publications, some of the and best. And by the investors. way, every subscriber who subscribes because of Baltimore Positive gets a free 10-minute session of cello with Max Weiss. There you I, go. I, I'm giving that away, free of charge. You, you, you can't beat that. But before we get to the latest article, Ron, um, you got this terrific book. If you love Baltimore, it will love you back. I will tell you that I did recognize some of those items, I think, in the 50 Reasons to Love Baltimore. Look at him. He's got it all tabbed, Ron. Right, Look right, at that. Right he's, got now, little, he's a school teacher. <laughs> I'm a te Once a teacher, always a teacher. How are we doing with the book? It's, what's the response to the book out there? You know, I loved it. How are people responding? Um, yeah, the book, um, If You Love Baltimore, We'll Love You Back, 171 Short But True Stories. Um, it's been great. It's been overwhelming, really. You know, I, I um, that the title, If You Love Baltimore, We'll Love You Back, is, is partly my experience of the last decade reporting in Baltimore, you know, the, the, the resilience of, of Baltimoreans, you know, being there for each other is really where the, where the, um, the title comes from. It's also my personal experience, you know, in, in reporting and, and, and being a, a transplant to Baltimore about 35 years ago. Um, and the response has been the same. It's, it's, um, it's been overwhelming. I've probably done 12 different virtual events and readings. I think on Amazon, it's the number one Baltimore selling book. Um, so it's just been Yeah, pull it up great. here on your website. We, the, the, the covers here. Covers are fun when you're doing a book, right? Like Patterson Theater, National Break. I mean, you can only put so much in it, but yeah. to convey Baltimore, I mean, we have the harbor, right? I mean, it's very easy to do. Boy, there's – the more we talk to people like you about this place – the more we dive in and want to go get a pizza at some place we haven't been or meet someone or, I mean, in your stories, you and I were just jamming about it. It turns out that Danny Wiseman's in these <laughs> really incredible characters. John Stedman used to tell me about the character bowl. Don, you familiar with this? Yeah. Mr. Diz and all of these 
cast of Baltimore characters that, uh, yeah. uh, that you have assembled. And the, the good news is we keep, like, finding more and more of them, right? There, there are more people every day here, especially during this pandemic, that are stepping up as, I mean, I'll call them heroes, but people stepping up to try to do good things here every day. And I think they're being spotlighted more during this pandemic. Well, I, I, again, if, if you're out there, you're listening to this, it's the holiday season, you're pulling your hair out, you need that last minute gift or stocking stuffer. Uh, if you love Baltimore, it will love you back. Ron Cassie, I guarantee you, whoever you give it to, it will be passed around because it's a page turner. Just a terrific book. And again, Ron. There is, there is a Christmas story and a Kwanzaa story as well in the book. There you Perfect. go. So right now, if you can support your local bookstore, terrific. Or else go out there and give Mr. Bezos a little more love. But wherever you do, if you love, if you love Baltimore, it will love you back. Well, if, if Mackenzie's getting a piece of that, it's coming right back to Coming copy. right back. Her yeah, 4.2 billion. Well, Ron. In this month's edition, it seems to me you're doing this. I, I, I'm just warning you, you probably are going to have to be a regular because it seems like every month you're writing some compelling piece that my, my wife and kids always make fun of me. When I get gripped by a story, a book, or an article, for some reason, there's something in my personality that makes me read it out loud. So I'll come to another I'll say, listen to this part. Listen to this part. Well, this time, Ron, and we're going to get you to jump right in, it started, and I read this to Max, it started in the very first paragraph, and I'm going to read it again because it's a world that I or my children or my grandchildren know nothing about, but thousands and thousands of young people and families in the city. This is their reality. And it goes like this. The first time someone shot at him, Kevin Sherd was a tall, skinny 16-year-old. He'd been playing basketball when another kid he barely knew walked up and accused Sherd of disrespecting his girlfriend. When the teenager reached for the gun in his front waistband, quote unquote, dip in Baltimore parlance, Sherd chucked the basketball under his arm and ran. The next time someone pulled a gun on Sherd, he was 17 and the target of a street robbery. When he was 21, a guy took a shot at him in broad daylight on West Fayette Street over a neighborhood beef. This time, he shot back. That's how the article begins. I, take us from there, Ron. Talk about the Iron Pat Pipeline and a young man named Kevin Sherd. Well, Kevin Sherd is a um, he was an anti-gun violence advocate today. He's, he's an author. Um, he's he's fifty now, um, or will be fifty this next year. Um, you know, I wanted to get a sense that um, there's a lot of people in Baltimore, West Baltimore, East Baltimore, young guys who, who get a weapon. And they're not intending to murder somebody. They're fearing for their own life, um, which is the case with, with Kevin Shear. They're growing up in dangerous circumstances that it's hard for us to appreciate, um, for most people to appreciate. And I think if if you talk, if you talk to, to school teachers in Baltimore who, who have young male middle school and high schoolers, they'll, they'll tell you that this is the case. And, and um, you know, unfortunately, the, the, the accessibility of weapons is such in Baltimore that, that you can come across weapons um, pretty easily. You know, if you have, if you have the money, um, you know, or, or the connections. And so the, the story of the Iron... So we were all worried about the drugs, right? Like, literally, right? Like, that? The accessibility to drugs has always been an issue in the city. 30 or 40 years ago, maybe it wasn't accessibility to this kind of weaponry, right? Yeah, well, the weapons have changed for sure, um, the, the, right? The, the Baltimore Police Department used to have six-shot revolvers, and guys in the 80s had midnight specials, right? That has changed with these high magazine clips and these semi-automatic pistols and things like that, the prevalence of those as well as these gun kits now that you can buy online, they don't even have serial numbers and put together yourself pretty easily. Like even somebody like I could put, put them together, just a couple parts. But the, 
the, the iron pipeline, the idea, and partly the story is that, uh, the main idea of the story is that there's two things. More guns create more violence. That's just inevitable. That's, that's just the nature of supply. Um, and where these guns come from is not Baltimore City. There's only one gun shop in Baltimore City. It's owned by an ex-police officer on East Baltimore Street. Um, they don't even come from Maryland anymore. We, Maryland passed pretty strict gun purchasing requirement laws in 2013. Um, and it really limits the straw purchases, purchases of like, you know, if, if you don't have a felony, if, or you, know, if you have a felony, but you know somebody who doesn't, you can get them to buy the weapon for you, often a woman. Um, that's much harder to do now in Baltimore. You have to have a permit. You have to, you have, to have a written test. You have run, to- run me through that. Run me through that. As a Baltimore resident without a weapon, I thought that I could drive out to the Maryland fairgrounds whenever they all get together and bring in the, you know, the camo and do, you know, the, the, you know I mean, I, I've seen the scene, right? Yeah. That I could just walk in there, pull my ID out and say, I'm 52 years old. I'm in America. I've never committed a crime that anybody's aware of anyway. Um, and, um, y- you know, I'll have that with that and decide of that. And, uh, and here, give me, give me some cash. You, you know, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I figured, I figured it would not be hard for me to bring home. And my wife hates it when I call it a machine gun. She said, you sound dumb saying that because it's not a, it's a semi auto It's an AK, but whatever it is, you know what I yeah. mean? I have an off the air name for it and it involves phallic things, but nonetheless, I've always been of the belief that I could go get a gun today if I wanted one. Is yeah. that wrong? Yeah, that is wrong. Okay. Um, you know- in Maryland, you can tell for, I put a lot of effort into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if there was a gun show up at the fairgrounds, um, you know, you could you could purchase a long gun, a rifle, essentially. But these are not the guns that are used to commit crimes, right? Pretty hard to, to hide. I, I would buy something to hunt a deer, is what you're telling me, right? Yeah, you. It's pretty hard to hide that and sneak up on somebody and 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 kill them in West Baltimore, East Baltimore, South Baltimore, anywhere. So the, the kind of guns that are used to commit. Um, homicides in Baltimore, gun violence, you know, are, are, are more and more of semi-automatic pistols, right? Those you need um, a permit for, you know, you get a license, you apply for these things, and then, then there's a background check run. And you have to show, um, in Maryland now, you have to show um, that you can know how to use a weapon. You have to, there's a, um, like a driver's test, you have to go to a range and show you know how to, to, to discharge the weapon properly. Um, so it's, it's much more akin in, both in Maryland to buying a car, right? You need a permit, you need a license, now you don't need insurance, but you need to give over your information to the dealer when you buy a weapon. The state police is gonna run a background check, just like the NBA is gonna run a check to see if you have any flags. So that process exists in Maryland. You're also only allowed to buy one gun a month in Maryland. Now, if you go to Georgia, for example, none of these things apply, right? There will be a quick background check at the store. It will go through the FBI's computer. So if you're a felon, you have a felony conviction, you're not going to walk in there, Nestor. You're going to get your lovely wife to walk in there, who I'm sure does not have a felony charge, and she can buy the weapon for you. In fact, ATF agents, FBI will tell you that they have, they've seen plenty of store surveillance and know of women who've gone in there. And it's not just women, but it's often women, a girlfriend or, or somebody else. Um, who will take cell phone pictures of guns and text them to their boyfriend who's sitting in the parking lot who the gun's ultimately for. There's plenty of stories of guys going into gun shops with, with another guy or, or with a girlfriend and picking out the weapon, then having the other person purchase it, but then handing over the cash for it. So these kind of straw purchases um, are one big way that guns end up in Maryland from out of state. And, and I just want to get this up front. Two thirds of the guns recovered in Baltimore City that are associated with crime come from out of state. So this 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 gun traffic into this into this into the, the state is you know is, is an enormous problem. The numbers tick have ticked up steadily since 2013. After Newtown, the right the shooting in uh, the school in, in Connecticut, Governor Malley helped pass some of the strict strictest gun purchasing requirements in in Maryland in the country, and that that's. What that's done is, is made it hard to get a weapon in Baltimore, but it's like air pollution. Unless, you're, you know, unless the other states are going along with it, you're not really going to clean up your own air. Um, I mean, you're speaking of George the way I think about running across the border to get fireworks back in the day. You know, like, it's you just- very, very similar. Or, you know, I grew up in, uh, I went to high school in Pennsylvania. You know, we had 21, drinking age was 21. 
you know, New Jersey from Allentown was just about 30 minutes away. Um, you know, even sometimes if you, we'd go to Maryland, right? Um, DC was 18, uh, you know, when I, at that point, when I was 19. I, I took many of ill-fated trips, and it is a miracle that I am alive to talk about it. It's proof to me that there is a supreme being that somehow took care of what they say, drunks and stupid people, because the trips that I took from Western Maryland College down to Rita's on Route 1 in College Park, where you could drink at 18, uh, it, it just, it's crazy. So that really is what you're describing. Except here's guns. the difference. Here's the difference. And this is very important. No one, ATF, DOJ, Baltimore Police Department, the Safe Streets Violence Interrupters, anybody that I talked to, and I talked to, you know, I mean, probably 75 people for the story, believes that it's young guys or gangs from Baltimore are leaving to go get the weapons and bring them back. That's not what's happening. These guys do not have driver's license, most of them. They don't have access to vehicles. We have to remember most of the guys in the corner are not really making a living dealing drugs. They're getting some pocket money. Uh, they're maybe buying some clothes and things like that, but, but they're not, they're not, they don't own vehicles and, and a lot of them don't have driver's licenses. These guns are being bought elsewhere and being brought here. So that's, that's really important to understand as, as part of the problem. Um, and, you know, this problem has existed in New York for, for decades and they went after the problem in New York City really aggressively. And we know there's a lot of reasons why gun violence is prevalent. There's, there's, it's, it's, I don't think you can pit on New York success in reducing gun violence. Right? They used to have 2,000 homicides a year in New York City. Now they actually have less than raw numbers in Baltimore City. There's a lot of complicated factors and it's, it's, it's impossible to separate just one from the other. But one undoubtedly is that they've done an extraordinarily good job of, of limiting accessibility to weapons and targeting gun trafficking. You know, they, Bloomberg, when he was mayor there, went after, and it's in our story, went after pawn shops all over the deep south. Because it's, it's not, there's a lot of gun dealers, right? There's more gun dealers in the country than there are McDonald's, Subways, and Starbucks combined. Most of them, of course, are law-abiding because they don't want to lose their license, right? And they can make plenty of money you know, like a liquor store providing the rules. But these, there's rogue shops that sell out the back door that claim weapons are being, are being stolen. And Bloomberg was able to go after the specific rogue dealers and limit the, excess, the number of guns flowing from the Virginias and South Carolinas and Georgias into New York City. New York City also benefits because New Jersey has very strict gun purchasing requirements. And well, hey, Ron, let me, let me interrupt you. I want you to yeah. continue with that thought, but you, you intrigued me by what you just said. You said that Bloomberg was able to go after these rogue shops, but weren't the rogue shops in like the Virginias and the, were they, they, they weren't in his jurisdiction. So how did he make that happen? Yeah, well, they followed, um, New York City filed lawsuits that, um, that they were not, um, that they, were, that they were liable they were not following, um, uh, you know, the, the federal laws uh, that were applicable. For example, they are required, you know, like to keep records of who they sell to. And it's hard on the back end to go find out where the rogue gun shops are. That information, for example, I as a journalist or even a, a legislator cannot go to the ATF and say, you know, I want to know what's the, what where what where the guns are coming from in georgia what specific gun shops are these guns that we're recovering from in baltimore city where are they coming from the baltimore police department can do that but, but journalists and researchers and legislators even can't can't do that so it takes some work in the front end to identify these gun shops and then you have to of course you know drill down and find out where they're breaking the laws to be able to file lawsuits and, and, and bloomberg had the wherewithal you know um you know, I um, mean, independently wealthy, as we know, to to go after these shops. In, in well, the it's become obviously a, a, a passion of his. If, yeah. If you're just joining us, we are with Ron Cassie, senior editor, Baltimore Magazine, always writing great investigative pieces. In the latest edition of Baltimore Magazine, his article is The Iron Pipeline, talking about the incredible proliferation of guns on the streets of our city. Ron, one of the things you write in there, and I highlighted it, was that over the past three decades, the Baltimore City Police Department has removed 100,000 guns. Think about that, Nestor. 100,000 guns, according to Ron's research, in, in three decades. And then your last 
sentence in that particular paragraph is, and it hasn't made a dent. Right. Um, so I, you know, I interviewed Fred Bielfeld, and, and we could talk about the Gun Trace Task Force a little bit, their initial mission. But, you know, as Fred noted, and, and this was easy, easy to, pretty easy to research, you know, they were pulling three and 4,000 weapons a year off the streets for, for many, many years and still pull two, three, almost That's 3, 10 a day. 3,000 is 10 a day. Yeah. Right. So they're pulling a lot of weapons off the street. The supply you know, is never ending. It's, it's ceaseless. In fact, you know, you can make the case, you know, I think it's a little bit like, you know, opioids. You know, we keep, initially in the opioid epidemic, we were going after the end user on the street, the person, the addict who, who was, who was uh, had illegal drugs on their, you know, illegal prescriptions on their person. Eventually, it got so bad, we, we turned around, you know, and, and looked 180 degrees up the pipeline where these drugs were coming from from doctors and pill, writing bad scripts from pill mills. And we eventually went after the pharmaceutical industry, right? There's um, you know, big pharma and, and Purdue and everything that were liable for dumping this stuff on the streets. I mean, if you, if you put it out there, it'll get used. And, and so that's, that's part of the idea of the story is, 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 is one woman says who uh, works on this issue in Boston, you know, we have to start asking where these guns come from. Um, and in fact, with every crime, where do these guns come from? The, the first crime is not the kid on the street who's pulling the trigger. He's most likely not the first person even in Baltimore to possess that weapon. Somebody bought the gun illegally somewhere else from a gun shop with or without their knowledge. And there's, good, there's a good chance, if you talk to ATF people, that the gun shops that are selling these weapons have a pretty good idea when weapons are going to be or likely to be at least diverted into the legal black market. And they're not doing all they can to lock up their stores at night. Um, you know, one, one thing that came out in reporting is most people, including most Baltimore police or law enforcement people I talked to, believe the majority of these guns are, are stolen guns from houses and cars. And that's just not the case. You know, it, it, it's likely 10 to 15 percent and other people would say even, even lower. And, and you can imagine if, even if you're breaking into a home, you wouldn't know in advance that there's a, a handgun in that home that's available. Um, you don't know that a, an automobile, when you break into it, has a, has a gun in the, in the glove compartment. But you do know gun shops have guns. And the amount that the, the increase in thefts from gun shops is, is going through the roof. You know, there's been a, a 70% increase um, in, the, in the gun shop, in thefts of gun shops. Baltimore County in the last, I think, year, year and a half, had about 10 gun shop break Easier to break into well, that than a bank, right? But, and that's what You're prompted. I mean, they're uh, not, they're not, like, like pharmacies have to put away their, their opioids and stuff at night. Gun shops don't. You know, they well, but we have to give a shout out. We, we have to give a shout out to Baltimore County Executive uh, Johnny Oshevsky and the County Council because they recognize that issue, Ron, that you're talking about. And just recently passed uh, the Secure All Firearms Everywhere Act, the SAFE Act, which, again, some people objected to. And here's what it required, Nestor, that owners of gun shops keep their firearms <laughs> secured and locked up so that they couldn't be stolen. Is that accurate, Ron? That's my understanding. And that's exactly, and, and I think Melissa Hyatt, the police commissioner, gets some credit there as well with, right. with Councilman Oshevsky and, and the county council. Um, there were some really high profile cases in Montgomery County and Howard County the last couple of years. Uh, one involving, like, I think on back-to-back -back nights, um, burglars crashed a car into the front door of gun shops. Um, really, you know, brazen gun, gun robberies and of course, these are getting diverted immediately into the black market and being um, resold. But you know, more often than not, it's 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 a it's a really diffuse network. We say the iron pipeline because so many weapons come up I ninety five, right, or, or down ninety five from from Pennsylvania to Baltimore. But it's really a diffuse. It's it's not necessarily an organized um, you know gang related activity. It, it's often small purchases small numbers of people, they know somebody, they have a cousin in Baltimore and Maryland that they can load weapons, they know a drug corner they can go to, they can trade the weapons, pop their trunk, you know, trade 10 weapons for, for drugs, you know, and... Um, well, hey, Ron, if I'm, if I'm a 15-year-old kid in Baltimore, and, and, and a good kid, I'm not saying that some kids are good, some kids are, but, but a good kid, a kid that's kept my nose clean, go to school, but I get picked on, and this is the day that I get picked on I'm not a gangster in any kind of way. This is the day I get picked on one too many times. And I say, 
damn it, I've got to protect myself. For that 15-year-old kid who really doesn't know much about this network, how long would it take him to go out in his neighborhood and get a firearm? Um, well, I, I think it's probably hard to say. It'd be very different for each kid's circumstance, I would suggest. And, and I, I think that analogy you're making, you know, it's, it's somebody who legitimately would fear for their life. Right. Right, not just getting picked on like we all get picked on a little bit, you know, at least growing up. Um, it's probably related to their circumstances that they have older brothers, if they got uncles um, who are involved in the drug trade or have been in the past, somebody they can talk to and go to to get something. But if you are afraid for your life, legitimately, somebody's beefing with you and they, you know, they have a weapon, maybe they've shown it to you or something like that, or already threatened you with it, and you go to somebody, well, I mean, you know, Don, you can imagine you know, anybody with, with children or a brother or a nephew and says, look, I'm afraid this guy is going to kill me. I need something to protect myself. You can see how that transaction gets made because somebody's afraid and they can go to somebody else for help. And, you know, what everybody says, and this goes to guys in the, who, on the, in the, who are in the drug trade or something like that as well, is they'd rather get busted for having a gun on them, you know, than get caught without it. You know, but I guess but, my point is, Ron, and I think this is different for Nestor and me where we grew up and, you know, and I'm an old guy, so I know I'm a dinosaur, but this young man, I don't mean this to even be pejorative about this young man. The young man that I described, who let's say is now legitimately afraid, I'm guessing within a day he knows how to find this gun. See, I, I, I don't know that I or the kid in the suburbs knows how to do that. Maybe they do. Maybe I'm naive. But it seems to me that part of the problem is with this proliferation of guns. Shoot holes in my theory is that there are so many guns on the streets of the city. It's just not that hard for that kid to get a gun. It's not that hard. I mean, I, you know, I talked to um, like Dante Barksdale with Safe Streets, works in the mayor's office. And you know, he said, you know, if, if you got, if you got, you know, 10,000 bucks, we can go to Douglas Homes and buy 10 guns this afternoon. You know, um, it, it may be expensive. If you don't know somebody who has a gun, but, there's, you know, if you're, you know, we know about the cycles of uh, the mass incarcerations in Baltimore, the, the proliferation of the drug war. Um, if you know somebody who's been arrested, if you know somebody in your family who's, who's done serious time in prison, um, you know, there may be somebody, you know, in your network who knows somebody in their network who, who, can, who can get a gun to you, um, you know, for a short period of time without a lot of, a lot of money. It's not, it's not that hard um, to answer your question. It, it, it's not that hard. It's maybe a couple steps removed from asking right. something. So it, here, here was the other thing, Ryan, and you just alluded to it. And Nestor and I have certainly talked about it an awful lot over the past 18 months. I'm reading along, and anytime I see these words, I perk up. It's like, uh-oh, pay attention. Gun Trace Task Force. It because we hear, I mean, God, I'm not awful. sure so, how many of the citizens that like on my Facebook page really know the whole story. Well, right? that's what I'm saying. So, or, we've got like, so I'm going to have Ron take us back to the beginning because we know how this movie ends. Uh, we know that Wayne Jenkins is basically uh Tony Soprano and he's running this criminal operation. Yeah. And we've had Soderbergh and the guys on to talk about the book again. People can go back to our uh former episodes and listen to that, but. I like what Nestor just said, Ron. Take us back to the beginning, because it sounds like in the beginning, this thing actually was bred out of perhaps some good intentions. What's that old thing? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. That caught my attention. So take us back to the beginning of the gun trace tab. Yeah, I mean, that, that became, that, that's, part of the, that's part of the story in a sense. I mean, I think it's illuminating. You know, Fred Bielfeld, who, who um, as 10 years police commissioner, was widely praised and he had been chief of detectives in the two, early 2000s, mid 2000s, before he became police commissioner. And he understood, and this is what he told me, that, you know, pulling guns off the street was like putting a finger in the dike, you know, and these gun buyback programs were not making a dent. In it was ways, a peacock for like them to show that they did something, right? Literally. Right, exactly. That's a great, that's exactly true. And um, you know, in, in a sense, right, it's, it's essentially, it's more money for the gun manufacturing industry. The more guns you take off the street, the more guns they will make and sell, right, to replace those. 
So he, he, he knows this is a, a losing battle trying to pull guns off the street. You're not get, getting anywhere. And he, he wants to know where the guns committing crimes are coming from, realizing they're not coming from Baltimore City and, and less and less from Maryland over the years. And he creates the Gun Trace Task Force. That, that, the word trace, right? Let's find out where these guns come from. And um, initially, I talked to one of the founding members of the Gun Trace Task Force. They were looking at where these guns came from. They were, there was, um, you know, there might be a guy in Baltimore County, and this was one example an officer told me, who did not have a felony record. He would buy one gun a month, essentially, or two, and, and he would sell them on the street when he needed an extra couple hundred dollars to make rent. And he had a, you know, had a safe in his house. And these guns were being found in the streets of Baltimore. So, and they were looking at where guns were coming from, from West Virginia. I mean, that's, 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 um, that still goes on today. West Virginia to Edmondson Avenue, trade some guns for drugs. And so Bielfeld was trying to, to see where these guns were come from and interrupt this, this flow of guns, and illegal guns into the city. That are the ones that get, get, end up getting used in crimes, right? And, you know, he's, he's not micromanaging the gun trace task force. And eventually, um, you know, they, they lose um, sight of their mission. And, and, and amazingly, William Bratton, who, who was the police commissioner in LA and New York, was hired by the city by Anthony Batts when he came in immediately after, this is 2013, immediately after Bielfeld, and to do a study of the police department. And when William Bratton, a, a, a you know, stop and frisk guy, says that this gun trace task force is spending way too much time on administrative work. They need to be operational. They need to be on the street removing guns. Exactly the opposite of what Bielfeld felt. And of course, at that point, the wheels come off the cart of the gun trace task force. Now, there was already guys rogue in that little group by 2013. But at that, that's before Jenkins takes over. By the time is that, he- hey, Ron, Ron, keep going. But is that, is Bielfeld's, that's a fascinating point that you just made. Bielfeld said, uh, uh, uh-uh. was that because his police gut and instinct knew what would happen if these guys were turned loose on the streets? Well, his, his police instinct was, you know, it was a detective. Let's find out where these guns are coming from. Here's a crime. How does crime take place? What was the motive of the shooter? Where did the weapon come from? People don't shoot people. You know, I mean, you need a gun to shoot people. Where did that come from? So he starts, he realizes, as Nestor said, these gun, tra- these gun buyback programs are, are, are a joke. Now you got to pull, you come across illegal firearms, you got to get them off the street. But the idea that these big shows of, of putting, like we saw with drugs, you put tons of bags of weed on the table, you put d- guns on the table, we're doing something. Meanwhile, the supply never, never ends. So to, to, to turn down the spigot, and the research shows this, if you can turn down the spigot on the supply of guns, illegal guns and gun trafficking, if you can reduce the number of weapons coming in, you will reduce the number of homicides. There's a correlation there. And, you know, I think in Baltimore, we would do anything to reverse the, the homicide rate at this time. And, um, you know, if you start turning back, you know, if you save, you know, 20, if the, the number is 25%, you know, which, which study shows if you can turn down the spick on these illegal guns, you can, you know, reduce the homicide rate up to 25% in some cases. Well, that's, in Baltimore, that's a lot of lives, right? That's 75 lives a year. And we know every time there is a shooting, there's subsequent shootings to follow that shooting. And if I can just, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's really important, you know, as part of this story to realize that this, I don't, the word gun control does not appear in the story, right? I mean, one thing as a journalist, when you come across phrases like gun control, is to ask the question, what does that really mean? We don't refer to our automobile licensing and buying procedures as automobile control, right? The term gun control itself is, 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 a, is a kind of propaganda. So what we're talking about is gun purchasing requirements, not, not impeding the Second Amendment. And in fact, um, you know, some gun um, violence prevention advocates will say they're thankful for the, the, um, for the decision, the Heller decision in, in, by you know, Antonin Scalia famously wrote in DC that people have a right to have a gun in their home, Second Amendment right, you have a right to do that. That, that for some gun violence prevention advocates was important because it means that you can also have restrictions on the purchasing, that that's not illegal. You can have a gun, but the restrictions on purchasing, the requirements, 
right? That you have to show your ID, you have to pass a test, just like with a car, is all is valid. So I think you know that's important too, a part of the story is it's not about seizing weapons, it's not about restricting people's Second Amendment, it's about taking like we do an automobile, and this you know makes sense to me as a journalist, as an analogy, is is putting on common sense restrictions to limit the diversion of guns into the black market. Ron, Ron are you he's here from a, a Baltimore magazine. Go ahead, go ahead, Don. You want to no, continue on with the guns? Yeah, no, yeah, I do. I just want to to sort of wrap this up. There's really a two part question here. The first part is you end the story um, by referring to folks who refer to Baltimore as Little Palestine and as a war zone. Uh, that sends chills through those of us who love the city. So when we describe the current situation as a little Palestine and as a war zone, um, are you hopeful, Ron, as a reporter, that years down the road you'll be able to come back and revisit this story and say, Baltimore recognized the issue, made some significant changes, and turned the corner. Um, I don't know if I look at things from, you know, the, the you know, a hopeful point or, or if this is going to make a change. It's hard. It's hard to 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 know that kind of thing or think that way. I think, as a as a journalist, when, when I'm not trying to. I'm, I'm trying to understand the situation, right? And these are how people in Baltimore are explaining it to me. And, and I'm hearing, you hear it enough, right? You're convinced that it's, it's an accurate description. What, what, that, what came through in their voices, and these were, these were a couple of ex-offenders, and, 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 um, and I heard it from Safe Street Advocates and Erica Bridgeford as well, is that people are, are pessimistic that you're going to ever limit the supply of weapons. I mean, that's, it's just not in their experience. It's too easy to get. It has been for their whole life. I think as we talk about like a lot of issues, ultimately, you know, it's going to take some type of federal legislation. We can't clean up the Chesapeake Bay just by passing Maryland laws because of Pennsylvania and Virginia, right? We can't clean up our air pollution unless Ohio and West Virginia because of the, the winds that come from there. I think ultimately there's gonna be, have to be some federal restrictions. I mean, there's federal guidelines for, for buying a car, right? For having insurance and things like that. We just don't leave this up to states. And I, I think in Baltimore, we can make this last point, if two thirds of the automobiles in Baltimore that were involved in car collisions had come from out of state, I think we'd be wondering, why are all these cars from out of state causing collisions in Baltimore? What's going on here? That all, are, they, are they not trained, these drivers? Are there, are there no guidelines in other states for buying or, use, or, or selling a car? Um, and so I think we do have to sometimes look outside of Baltimore and, and look, think of our, hopefully our Maryland legislators, our, our, our mayors like Bloomberg with mayors against guns, will look to, for regional answers to these solutions a little bit. You know, our, our borders are very, are very porous. And I think we look to, for regional solutions to other problems. And I, and I think ultimately, if we're gonna turn down the spigot on firearms, I think ultimately what all the reporting shows is that um, we're gonna have to have a regional solution. And the last thing I'll say is, this is the same thing in Chicago. The majority of weapons come from in Northwest Indiana. The same thing with Los Angeles. The majority of weapons used in crimes come from Arizona and Nevada that have lax you know, gun purchasing requirements. Well, Nestor, Ron I think we always say, do we not? We like to get smarter. And what I like about what Ron did in this article is he lays out the issue, but then when you hear him talk there at the end, he's talking about real solutions, regional cooperation, regional addressing this issue that's not going to happen individually. So I feel a little smarter today, Nestor. Ron, I, I was going to ask you, uh, you know, you put in for the magazine in other ways as well, and we had Max on telling fun, happy stories about things we could do during a pandemic. Give me something, and I, I, I was fully um, – was it with you? It was with somebody that I told the, for the first time that I discovered that there was a pond at Patterson Park because of this, this, uh, th th this pandemic. What have you discovered about Baltimore the last seven, eight months here um, that you like right now or that's new, even if it's a slice of pizza somewhere? Um, I, I have been, I don't know if this is new, but, I, but this goes to how you opened up the show. I have, I have been eating probably every other night carry out from Little okay. Italy about the last two weeks. Um, Ciparelli, Sabatino's, Isabella's, Angelis Pizza, uh, Gia's last night. Um, 
So I've been making, I live in, by Patterson Park. I'm familiar with the, uh, with the pond and I have some, uh, you know, some orange footed friends over there. Um, and, but I've been, so I've been going to, to Little Italy quite a bit. I love that neighborhood. Um, my, my family, I have Italian roots heritage. And so I've been going to say hello to everybody. Thank them for being open through this pandemic and, and trying to support them. And I think um, you know, we're really lucky in Baltimore to have great neighborhoods, you know, just great, great neighborhoods. And, and, and so one of one I've been going to recently is Little Italy to eat out a lot. Well, I don't know if you know or not, but I, I put up a post last week when I went up there, and I want to share this with you because I'm starving right now, to be honest with you. This is a, this is a sloppy nest. It's it's a new sandwich uh, that we have over to Michi's. It, it's it, listen. I went in there about six months ago. I've been going to Michi's my whole life. I mean, yeah. I have had every you know every everything there ever was. And we were sitting outside. This is during plague time. I found the picture. It was back in like like maybe May or June, and we sat outside, and I said, you know what, I want the meatballs, and I want, I, you know, I feel like garlic toast tonight. She's like, what if I do the garlic cheese toast? And I'm like, why have I never had the garlic cheese toast here? They brought me out the garlic cheese toast. I plopped the meatball down. I cut it. I marinated it all up, and we've now named this the Sloppy Nest, not a Sloppy Joe. So I've been getting this for the, next, for the last six months, and after 20 started eating at Michi's in 1994. So 26 years it took me to discover that I could cut a meatball in half and put it on a piece of cheese toast and have it be like the greatest thing I've ever had in my life. So there, have it that. And I dare you to not go to a Michi's tonight, Woo! Cassie. How about that? Huh? Shop I local. I left out of the Michi's. I had, I had rice balls at a Michi's outside the sidewalk uh, only a couple of weeks ago on a warm, warm Saturday afternoon. So I'm, I'm there with you. Pony I'm Rotondo, telling, bring you home I'm every telling time. you, it's the holidays, the December edition, Baltimore Magazine, Ron Cassie's article, The Iron Pipeline, and eating, shopping, local. Nestor, does it get any more Baltimore positive than that? You know, if I weren't pimping the Taharka ice cream delivered to your door for $15.70 off eight for just 40 bucks. Baltimore positive. I tell people, go over to Vaqueros and you know, knock back some of that tiramisu, whatever the thing in there, and uh, you pick up some cookies to go and whatnot. So if you're down a little literally, take care, shop local. Make sure you take care of all of our friends here uh, locally. You're right around the corner from Taco Fiesta, my boy Jerry. Make sure you're over there giving him some love, getting some guacamole and uh, some salsa uh, and some uh, refreshments to go. On behalf of all of our sponsors, you, you can curbside Fadley's, which – I'm going to be doing very, very soon because I am starving right now, making myself hungry. This show's killing me. Uh, as well as ship those crab cakes anywhere in the country. Uh, and as well as over on the west side, you know about our friends at State Fair. You know about our friends over at El Guapo and Franco's where they also make a delicious meatball. Maybe I should do that. We should have a sloppy nest cook-off. And I'll get all the Italian restaurants to bring their meatballs, their garlic cheese toast, and we'll have a hoot nanny. Idea, Don. Write that one down. I feel like I got it. a night shift I movie. I got, got my that pad. One. Write that one I down. always have my pad. Right Write that one down. <laughs> On behalf of all of our friends over at Baltimore Magazine and a, a shout-out to the Mighty Max. By the way, everyone, Cheap special Max. deal at Baltimore Cheap, Ma Magazine. Max. If, you if you subscribe now, special 10-minute cello concerto of holiday music. Have yourself a very merry little Christmas with uh, Max. Mm. She didn't play the cello. I felt really bad about that, Ron. We had her on. She, she felt bad about it, so now we have to have her on next month to play the cello. Maybe she can play some. Guy Lombardo or something. I think, maybe go to, I think maybe viewers can go to her Instagram account if they, if they want to. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not the same <laughs> as if you do it on Baltimore Positive. It's not the same. Not the same. We are WNST.net AM 1570. Taos in Baltimore mixing some Ravens football, some civic duty. Uh, and through the holidays, we're going to have some Baltimore Positive Classic chats from our first two years here. Stay with us. We are WNST.net AM 1570. Taos in Baltimore. We never stop talking Baltimore Positivity.